So welcome this morning to uh, worship at Garfield Memorial Church. We're continuing with our teaching series, Worthy, uh, looking deep into worship. Last week, we looked at the call to worship, which is exactly what I'm doing today. And it said that we're called, Psalm 147 said, to do the hallelujah, to hallel, to put our trust and our and ground ourselves in Yah, Yahweh, the loving relational God, love of God. So I hope we can do that today. Uh, I'm Chip Freed, part of the teaching team here, and we're so glad. So let's let's turn and join together in song, uh, ye servants of God. Now we come to that time in service where we go before God in prayer. Um, and if you want to pray with your eyes open your, or your head bowed, it doesn't matter. There aren't rules. But the most important thing is that we do go connect with God in prayer. So will you, let's pray together. God, we thank you for being God in a world that has been so turbulent. In times that we just wonder what's next, we take our trust knowing that you are still God, from everlasting to everlasting. Uh, you never change. And we thank you for the, uh, the ability to ground ourselves in that truth. We pray, Lord, for any who are hurting right now. Uh, so many different prayer re requests that I receive and our house of prayer receives that are confidential. We don't share, but it's just a reminder of, of the hurt and the uh, confusion and fear that's that's rampant in the world and God uh, what it must be like to be you to hear the prayers of all of your people but your word is so clear that you are responsive to the prayers of your people they come up to you uh, prayers of adoration our Bible says like like the fragrance of of pleasing incense and we hear you attending at the burning bush saying I have heard my people's cries God thank you um, that our prayers don't change you, but they can change us. And so help us to continue to be people of prayer. And so let's ground ourselves in those words that Jesus taught us in the prayer that we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Think about that powerful prayer, deliver us from evil. That's a prayer we should lean into in the 21st century. In fact, Martin Luther used to comment that the original uh, Greek there can literally be pr prayed, deliver us from the evil one. Um, and so let's continue to stand firm. Uh, we just said this after Easter, putting on the whole armor of God that we can resist the wiles of the enemy. So we're at that time of offering. We continue to be so grateful for all of you. We have said, 
during this pandemic. Um, if you've been ad adversely affected financially, we do not want you to give. You can give other ways, through prayer, through encouragement, um, and, or jumping into a group. But for those of you who have been able to, you have sustained us in this most trying time, and you've given us the fuel to continue to widen the circle. So there are many ways to give. Uh, I know you've seen them on your screen. My wife and I, we set up uh, automatic deduct giving online. We've done that for years since we were ever able to do it. So if we're away or we're uh, out of town, even when we were worshiping in person, um, we knew our, our giving was happening to Garfield Church. So we hope you'll take advantage of those resources um, and let's uh, continue on today as we prepare for Pastor Scott to bring us a really important word from God.
So I wanna read uh, the scripture that Pastor Scott is basing the teaching on today. You find it in Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? My soul just shouted amen to that verse. But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all of their sins. Pastor Chip said earlier, we're continuing the series Worthy. Uh, worthy and worship go together. You could really say 
worship as worthship. We worship what we give worth to. And by worshiping someone, we're, we're expressing the worth that we give to that person or that thing. And we all worship something. Last week, Chip got us rolling with uh, talking about the call to worship and, and the importance of being called into worship and into that place and attitude and spirit of worship. Today, we're talking about something that we don't do a lot of in Garfield Memorial Church. And, and that is talking about confession. Many faith traditions have a specific designated time within worship for confession. Uh, some faith traditions like the Catholic Church uh, invite confession in a very uh, serious, formal way when you go to, to, to visit the priest in the confessional. We don't talk a lot about confession here. We're gonna talk about that today. But when, when, when we worship, our hope is that in some way we encounter God, that we experience God and God's presence, that we get a glimpse of God. But getting a glimpse of God can have some unexpected results. The fact is, the more clearly we see God, the more clearly we see our own brokenness and our own sin. Think about Isaiah and in Isaiah chapter six, one of the great prophets, and he had a vision, a dream, where he appeared in the throne room of God. And his response wasn't to jump up and sing. It wasn't to clap his hands. It wasn't to shout for joy. It was to say, woe is me. I'm a person of unclean lips and I come from a people of unclean lips. When Peter in the boat first encountered the power of Jesus and he first got a glimpse that this, this prophet from Nazareth was more than just a prophet from Nazareth, but God incarnate, what did Peter do? He, he, he stepped back and he said, God, get away from me. Jesus, get away from me. I'm unclean, I'm unholy. The closer we get to God, the more, we aware, be, more aware we become of God's greatness and God's holiness and God's wonder, the more we can join with that psalmist in saying, out of the depths, I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Hear, be attentive to my cry for mercy. We become aware of our need for mercy as we become aware of God's holiness. What we need in those moments when we are aware of God's holiness, God's beauty, God's awesomeness, and at the same time aware of our own deep brokenness, our own sinfulness, our own wrongdoing, what we need at that moment, whether we realize it or not, is confession and assurance. The assurance, we try to jump to assurance sometimes before we do the confession. We need the confession before we can really receive that assurance. So that's what we're doing today. We're gonna to talk through confession because we don't do that a lot. I'm gonna spend a little more time on confession, actually a lot more time on confession than on assurance. And the first thing I wanna talk about is what is confession? Because we have a real misunderstanding of that in our culture. One of the reasons we misunderstand it, again, because we don't talk about it a lot. And when we hear that word confession, if you're anything like me, I love crime dramas, Law and Order, the original series, one of my favorite TV series ever. Uh, you know, my wife and I, when we watch the reruns, usually by the end of that first clip where they find the dead person, we already know what the whole episode's going to be about anyway. And, and in every episode of Law and Order and all of the great crime dramas and, and United States television and movie histories, what are they after? A confession. They want the wrongdoer to admit to their wrong. And that's our understanding of confession. That, that when we confess to a specific sin, a specific crime, a specific wrongdoing, when we admit wrongdoing, that's not what the Bible was talking about. That's, that's one small subset of biblical confession. I'm gonna go back a little bit here into the roots of ancient Hebrew, the Old Testament written in Hebrew, and ancient Hebrew is different than modern Hebrew. And in ancient Hebrew, the word that we translate confess has a very literal physical meaning. It means to throw out the hand like you're throwing something or grabbing something. And that word, the word in Hebrew itself, and I'll butcher the pronunciation is yadah, that word is also translated in different places in the Old Testament as praise. The same word to confess sin is used to call us to praise God. 
That maybe that's why uh, Martin Luther used to talk about the confession of praise as well as the confession of sin. But think about it: if it's if the if if the if the root comes from a physical activity of throwing your hand out to throw something or grab something, think about throwing your sin away, your wrongdoing away, and grabbing hold of God, or thinking about throwing praises in God's direction and and grabbing hold of God's glory and God's hope. The, the two ideas go together. It's a physical activity that involves a physical bodily expression that is about confession. One way to think of confession in light of all of this and boil it down is this. To confess is to say about a thing what God says about a thing. So when we say Jesus is Lord, we're saying about Jesus of Nazareth what the Father in heaven is saying about Jesus of Nazareth. And that's why we call that a confession of faith. We're saying about a thing what God says about it. When we say God is great and mighty and glorious and loving and merciful and forgiving and just and powerful, we're saying about God what God says about himself. We're confessing as we praise. When we identify our own brokenness and speak that out, we are confessing our sin, our brokenness. We're saying about ourselves what God says about us. Confession is about saying about a thing what God says about a thing. So why do we need to confess? Why is it important? Why take a, a whole message and devote it to it? Why, why make it such a central part of the part of worship and our relationship with God? Well, think about it this way. Now, you know, talking about crime dramas a minute ago, another crime drama. I haven't seen this one myself. True Detective, maybe you've seen it. I think it's on Netflix. Rust Cole, I believe, played uh, uh, by Matthew McConaughey in the series, is, is a detective. And, and he's known for being able to get a confession. And, and, and someone asked him, they, they asked, how do you do it? And his method is rooted in a philosophy about human nature. And this is what Rust says. He says, look, everybody knows there's something wrong with them. They just don't know what it is. Everybody wants confession. Everybody wants some cathartic narr narrative for it. The guilty especially and everybody's guilty. Even in our popular culture, we have a sense that we're all broken. We share a common brokenness. Um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who, who, who experienced the brokenness of humanity as much as any human being who has ever lived, great Russian novelist and historian, he died in 2008. He spent time in the Russian gulags, the prisons, and the gulag, in his book, The Gulag Archipelago, he said this, he said, if only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds, and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them, but the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? Solzhenitsyn. And by the way, I gotta, I gotta throw out some praise and give some credit and, and props to uh, Pastor Terry McHugh. We, we collaborated on this message and prep preparing it. And that's one of many contributions that Terry made, that quote from Alexander Solzhenitsyn. And, and but Solzhenitsyn hit it right where we are. We're all broken. There's no separating the, the evil people from the not evil people. We all have evil within us, within our hearts. That's why Jesus said when, when, when he told that story about the, the, the sower and the sower went out and sowed seed in a field, not the one you're thinking of. It was a different story of a sower. And then the, the enemy went out and sowed weeds among the wheat. And, and the servants of the Lord, the angels came and said, do you want us to pull up the weeds? And, and God said, no, let them all grow up together because if you pull up the weeds, you're gonna pull up the wheat with them. I'll separate it all out. I'll take care of all of that at the end of days. You see, we can't destroy all of the evil in the world without destroying ourselves as well. We have evil and brokenness in our hearts, in our spirits, souls, and bodies. And we can't just eliminate it without destroying ourselves. Only God can do that. And confession is a key part of that. One of the reasons we need to confess then is because we're broken. 
Every single one of us is broken. It's not a question, again, of finding the evil people and if we could just get rid of those people or the people that did that or the people that said that or the people that looked like that or the people that dressed like that or the people, you know, whatever category we have. And we're so good at that as human beings of having these special categories of evil and say, well, I know I'm a sinner, but at least I'm not like that. You know, someone's saying the same thing about you. There's sin and brokenness and evil in all of us. And we need to confess it. We need to speak about our brokenness, what God speaks about our brokenness. And that begins with identifying, I'm broken too. The psalmist there said, oh man, I got to go back and find it because I just forgot it. Ah. No, it wasn't. I'm sorry. It wasn't the psalmist. It was, it was, it was Isaiah when he said, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I'm among a people of unclean lips. That lips, it's how we speak. And, and we're told that what we speak is what comes from our heart. And so to have unclean lips is an acknowledgement that my heart is unclean and my heart is broken too. That was the ancient Hebrew way of saying, Isaiah saying, I'm broken. I'm broken. And I come among a, from a broken people. Because that's the other part of why we need confession. It's not just that you and I are broken, but the world is broken. Our cultures are broken. We grow up in brokenness. And part of growing up in brokenness means that there are things that we do that we think are good, we think are right, we think they're normal, we think they're okay, we think God wants us to do them, and God looks at him and says, that's broken. That's broken. Now, before I would jump into any contemporary, because anytime you start pressing those buttons in a message about the things we do as a culture that, that, that we think are right, well, you know, we're going to immediately start polarizing and dividing. So I'm going to step away from that for a minute. And let's go all the way back again to the ancient Hebrew culture, to King David and, and, and a man whom the Bible says, God in the scripture says, this is a man after my own heart. If there was anybody who wasn't broken other than Jesus, it was David. I got news for you. David was broken. And part of David's brokenness was a cultural brokenness. And it comes out so clearly in the story of his encounter with Uriah and Bathsheba. I'm going to summarize. I'm going to cut this down super small. You could do a whole series of messages just on that story. But David was king. Uriah was not, he was king of Israel. David was a Jewish person, a Hebrew, an Israelite, a child of Abraham. Uriah was a Hittite. He was not an Israelite. He was, in many respects, a, uh, a mercenary. He was in David's army as a soldier for hire. But he and David were also very close. They were friends. And, and Uriah's house was right next to David's palace. And in that day and age, you know, Everybody understood power like we understand it now. And the closer you were to the seat of power, the more privilege, the more respect, the more uh, authority and power you yourself had. So David, the scripture tells us, sent everyone out to war except himself. Joab went out to lead the armies where King David should have. Uriah went out to fight in the war, even though he was not even an Israelite. The Ark of the Covenant went out. The Bible tells us even God was out fighting the war, but David stayed back in the palace. And one evening after dark, he was out on his balcony and he looked down and he saw a young woman who had undressed and was bathing in the torchlight on her roof. Now, scholars disagree about what this was about. Some say Bathsheba may have been doing some sort of ritual cleansing and had no intent of trying to draw David's attention. Other people say, you know what, there's, there's, if you and I think about it, would we not realize that was the king's balcony and waiting till night in torchlight to bathe? Would we not be, you know, we don't know what was on for sure on Bathsheba's mind, whether she was trying to get David's attention or not, but she got it. And David called for Bathsheba, had him come to her and he slept with her. And then he sent her away, shaming her. And then she sent a message back to him saying, I'm pregnant. And then now David's going, all right, I did this thing. I got to save face. I got to have Bathsheba save faith. I need to have Uriah save face. The way we'll do that, I'll invite Uriah back from the war. He can go home with his wife. And then we can all pretend that the baby is Uriah's. 
honor is preserved, everything's good. He invites Uriah back, but gossip is always what it's been. Uriah knew long before he got there what the situation was. None of this was done in secret. David sent messengers to bring Bathsheba to him. Bathsheba sent messengers back with the message to David that she was pregnant. Uriah knew when he got there what the story was, and he wasn't going to play. He refused to go into his own house. He wouldn't even give the appearance that he was having relations with his wife, and he wouldn't get along. David finally tried to get Uriah drunk enough that he would go home without thinking about it. Uriah still wouldn't go home. So David sent Uriah back to the front lines, told the commander of Joab of the army to put Uriah in a position where he would get killed. And that's exactly what happened. And at the end of the story, after that, after Uriah dies, a period of mourning is over. David invites Bathsheba in. He marries her, has his baby, and everything's okay. And no one had any problems with that. No one was concerned about it. There's not a hint in the scripture that David was, was angst-filled or guilt-ridden, that his conscience was pricking him. There's no sense that, that anyone was concerned about it. And the writers tell us this because at the end of that story, of that portion of the story, the, the writer of the scripture says this, but what David had done displeased the Lord. And now Nathan, the prophet, was sent to David by God to help David understand that what David had done had displeased the Lord. Now, you and I, we, we think differently than David did. We can see the wrong that was there, but from David's perspective and from the perspective of that kingdom and that culture at that time, David did what kings were allowed and expected to do. David did what Samuel warned the children of Israel kings would do if they wanted a king other than God. He took what he wanted, he did what he wanted, and he did it for himself. And everyone was like, that's just what kings do. Uriah is dead, but that's his fault because he wouldn't play the game. But it displeased God. It displeased God. The problem here was that David's brokenness was part of a cultural brokenness, and he didn't even see it. He was completely blind to it. And Nathan, as the voice of God, the person of God, representative of God, had to explain to David what he had done wrong. That's why in Psalm 51, when David talks about this incident, he says in his prayer, he says, Lord, against you only have I sinned, because no one else thought it was a sin. What he did was perfectly legal in his day, was culturally acceptable in his day for a king to behave that way. But it wasn't acceptable to God. He hadn't broken any human laws, but he'd broken God's laws. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Thou shalt not commit murder. David had done those things. And God called him to account. And David ultimately confessed. And he said something very similar to what Isaiah said in the midst of all of this. Hear this. Against you, you alone have I sinned, David speaking to God, and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. Part of that, what David's saying is, is I was born into this sin. My culture, my mom, my, everyone around me accepted this as okay, but it's not okay. Look, folks, the truth is, when we stand before judgment one day, we're going to find out from God that there were a lot of things we did that we thought were okay, that God says, no, abomination. Think back to the pre-war South, where, where massive portions of the Western world, white men in particular, said it's okay to own people with brown skin, that they're not even really human. It's okay to exterminate people with brown skin and take their land because they're not really human, not in the same way we did. And people that claim to be followers of God believed that. They were born into sin. From the moment they were conceived, they weren't going to escape that. And there's stuff like that in our very own culture now. So we need to confess. We need to confess. But what comes from it? What comes from us looking at these things in our lives and saying, I'm going to speak about this the way God speaks about it? What comes from that? What, what fruit does it bear? 
Hear this, listen to this. This is a, a story uh, told by Kathleen Norris in her book, Amazing Grace. Um, uh, it's an amazing book. She's an amazing writer, and this is a true story. This really happened. Um, she was working as an artist in residence at a parochial school teaching children how to write poetry using psalms as a model. It's a great thing to do, by the way. If you want to write some poetry, use the psalms as a model. One little boy wrote a poem entitled, entitled The Monster Who Was Sorry. He, Norris says this, he began by admitting that he hates it when his father yells at him. His response in the poem is to throw his sister down the stairs and then to wreck his room and finally wreck the whole town. The poem concludes this way. Then I sat in my messy house and, and then I sit in my messy house and say to myself, I shouldn't have done all that. Norris says this about it. My messy house says it all. With more honesty than most adults could have mustered, the boy had made a metaphor for himself that admitted the depth of his rage and gave him a way out. He was well on the way toward repentance. Not a monster after all, only human. If the house is messy, why not clean it up? Why not make it into a place where God might wish to dwell? What comes from confession? What's the fruit of that? Confession makes space for God to come into our lives. Maybe this is what the psalmist was writing about in 130 when he said this, I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. In his word, I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than the watchman wait for the morning. More than the watchman wait for the morning. He's waiting for God to come in. Watchmen waiting for morning could have been two, one of two different things. Either military watchmen on the walls, nighttime was dangerous. There were no spotlights, there was no radar, there were no motion detectors. If bat, lots of bad things happened at night and waiting for dawn, the watchmen wanted dawn to come. When sunlight broke over the horizon and they could see that the way before them was clear and safe, when their shift had ended and they could go home and rest and be reconciled with their family, the other thing that happened at dawn, morning sacrifices were given to God. And these were perhaps temple watchmen waiting for dawn to break to offer sacrifices to God that would allow that relationship with God to be maintained. Waiting for God to come in. When we confess, when we confess, we can wait with great hope that God will come in. David said the same kind of thing after his sin. He said, don't cast me from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. You see, confession, once we pull it out of that, that legal melodrama place that it has in our minds, confession is not about the law. Confession is not about getting a stamp of pardon from a judge. Confession is about relationship and restoring that relationship. God, if we refuse to speak about things, whether it's ourself or the people around us or the world in which we live or God himself, if we refuse to speak about this world and our place in it the way God speaks about it, how can we be in relationship with God? Because God's the author of reality. God is the author of this. God is the author of the kingdom that is to come. And if we refuse to, to agree with God about the nature of that kingdom, how can we have a place in that kingdom? God isn't a bully demanding his own way. God's the author saying this is the way it is. And if you can't see it that way, if you can't see that a kingdom, that my kingdom includes people of every tongue, every tribe, every nation, and if you're not good with being in deep, close, loving, mutual, compassionate, caring relationship with people of every tongue, tribe, and nation, then how can we be in God's kingdom? How can we be in God's kingdom? And how can God's kingdom be in us? The fruit of confession is reconciliation. It's reconciliation. And that reconciliation is individual as well as corporate. N.T. Wright, uh, a, 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 a author and, 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 and scholar of Christianity, um, had a book on worship and he was writing about uh, uh, the testimony of a murderer who was in prison in Great Britain. He had a life sentence. He'd been reading a lot of different philosophies from a lot of different cultures and a lot of different places. And he came across the Bible and he read Psalm 51, that Psalm of David confessing his sin. David's prayer. 
In his testimony, he said that while he didn't believe in God, hear this, he didn't believe in God and didn't know what worship was, when he read the psalm and confessed his sin, he began to worship the God who was so powerful that he could cleanse his guilt and show him unfailing love. And he said he found himself on his knees in awe as the prodigal son who was finally home. And he never wanted to leave. Confession opens the door for reconciliation, for a restored relationship with God and also with other human being. Hear this one. This is one of my favorite stories ever. Again, I got to give props to Terry. A lot more than just what I've specifically, but Terry told me about this. I got the book and I read the section myself. This is incredible. Donald Miller, an author, a, a, a follower of Jesus, wrote a book called Blue Like Jazz. And, and he tells a story how, how at one point he was, in, he was living out in Oregon and, and there was a school, Reed College, and, and this was a very, this school was very openly uh, hostile to Christianity and, and religion in general, Christianity in particular. And Christians were, were often treated with hostility on the campus. But, but Miller and some others, they, they wanted to be there on campus as Christians, as people of faith, Miller wasn't even actually a student. He was auditing one class that allowed him to be on campus, but they didn't want to go in with this sort of arrogant mindset of we're going to take this campus for Jesus. We're going to tell everybody what they're doing wrong so they can repent. Quite the contrary. Miller struggled with his own faith as he saw the brokenness in the church and in its history, how it had been complicit in slavery, complicit in genocide, complicit in so many evil things. And he saw his own brokenness in his own life. Every year at the university, they had a Ren Fair. And, and Ren Fair was an excuse to get drunk, to get high, and to do what college students often do when they're drunk and they're high. There were also big things that were set up at a particular place on campus. And he and a small group of friends, they came up with the idea during Ren Fair, we'll build a confessional in the middle of Ren Fair. And we'll invite people to come in and confess their sins. Donald actually, Don, he, he gave that idea as a joke. He didn't mean to do it. Everyone else loved it. He was like, we'll get killed. They built a big confessional, but they did it differently. See, instead of inviting people to confess their sins, when people came in, Don and his friends confessed their own sins and the sins of the church and asked for forgiveness. And, and when it started, Donald, when the first person came in and he was scared to death how they were going to react, and, and Donald said, you know, I, I said, so you want me to confess, tell you what I've all done wrong? He said, no, actually, I want to tell you what we've done wrong as the church. And, and he went into the old stuff and the big picture stuff of racism and genocide and empirical, imperialism and, and those kinds of things and, 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 and sexism. And, and the guy said, well, I'm sure you weren't personally involved with any of those things. And and Miller said, no, but I've done this and I've done that and I'm broken and, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm guilty. And, and, and the man forgave him. And there was reconciliation. And person after person came in. There were too many people that wanted to do this to come into the confessional. And other folks in the group were meeting with people standing outside of it. Other were, were, were sitting at picnic tables around it. And after this, before that, any time this group had tried to do anything, the most they got were like four or five people from campus that would show up. But they started doing groups on, on, on addressing poverty and, and dealing with racism. And 40 and 50, 60 people came to these things. Why? Because the followers of Jesus didn't lead with their strengths. They led with their weaknesses. They confessed. And what was the fruit of their confession? Reconciliation. Now, we're running out of time. I got three minutes to talk about assurance. Um, assurance, I think we intellectually understand a little bit better. Assurance is this, that when we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. John wrote that in his first letter, 1 John 1.9. We confess our sins. God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. But how do we know we're forgiven? How do we have that assurance? I got good news for you and I got bad news for you on this. Good news is this. Scripture tells us over and over and over and over again, God and his own word says, if you confess, I will forgive you. The if is important. 
if we're not willing to speak about ourselves and the world around us as much as we are able and as much as we can see as God see, sees it and as God says, if we're in, in other words, if we're in active rebellion, God, I know you say it's this way, but I choose to disagree with you. You know, you're in a tough spot there. But if we confess, God forgives. No matter how far off track we have gotten individually or as a culture. Pastor Chip read these verses earlier. If you, O Lord, keep a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? None of us. If God's up there keeping, keeping a list of everything I've done wrong and God's going to hold that against me when I die, I don't have a prayer. If God's going to keep a list of all of these things, none of us can stand. I don't know, maybe you're better than me. Maybe you'll be okay. I know I'm not. But the psalmist says, but with you, God, there is forgiveness so that we can, with reverence, serve you. Again, see, it's not about a stamp of pardon. It's about relationship. I can be in relationship with you. You can be my Lord and I will be your servant. You can be my father. I will be your child. We can be in that relationship. And then later in the psalm, the psalmist writes, Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. Over and over again, the Bible tells us, God tells us, if you confess, I will forgive you. In fact, Jesus has taken the action of forgiveness, done the act of forgiveness, dying on the cross, taking our burden of sin upon himself. Even before we confess, the forgiveness is there. Confession opens the doors so that we can receive it and be reconciled to God. That's the good news. The bad news is you might not feel it. You might not. I don't always feel forgiven. By God's grace and by God's grace alone, I have those moments when that, that, that feeling of forgiveness breaks in and it's like, it's like dawn breaking. And I can say, thank you, Lord. Thank you. You see me. You know me. And I agree with you. I'm a broken mess. But you love me. And you forgive me. And you receive me as your son. We don't always feel it. But the good news is it's always true whether we feel it or not. It's one of the ways the devil messes with us. He'll take our feelings and he'll use them against us. And he said, well, you don't... You feel dirty, you feel gross, you feel disgusting, you feel ashamed. Uh, you're right, you are, you're stuck, you're dead, you're done. God can never love you. We can feel awful. That doesn't change how God feels about us. But when we confess it and we remember what God has said, I will forgive you, then we have that assurance. We have that assurance. I don't know... You know, oh, Jesus hanging on the cross. He's so amazing. Hanging on the cross. He's been rejected. He's been abused. He's been humiliated. He's been mocked. He's been ridiculed. Even, even by the criminals being crucified next to him. And then somewhere along the way, one of those criminals, I don't know, maybe they'd heard stories about Jesus. Maybe they saw how Jesus was reacting or not reacting to what was going on around him. And he looked at Jesus. He said, Lord, have mercy on me. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. An act of confession. He identified Jesus for who he was. He identified himself for who he was. He said to the other folks being crucified, look, we're here. We deserve to be here. We broke the law. This man did nothing. Do you hear the confession? He spoke as God spoke about the situation. I'm guilty. I'm broken. Jesus is not, but he's dying anyway. And he looked at Jesus and he called him Lord. And Jesus didn't judge him. Jesus didn't condemn him. Somehow, hanging on that cross, Jesus smiled and said, you know, today you'll be with me in paradise. You hear that, what that was? 
That was reconciliation. It wasn't today you'll be in paradise. It wasn't today I'll be in paradise. It was today you'll be with me in paradise. That's the hope we have. That's the assurance we have. The confession opens the door for reconciliation. And God promises, promises that he'll be reconciled with us as we confess to him in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good preaching always makes you want to preach. That's what Dr. Gardner C. Taylor told me. And I, I just was so moved by this, this message on confession. Uh, maybe that's what's lacking in our country right now. We're a lot of people shouting at one another. Not a lot of people confessing their own failures, their own uh, faults. None is righteous, no, not one. And the thing that's sticking with me that Scott shared when he shared that, you know, we're all guilty, I knew that. Um, Jesus said, none is righteous, no, not one. I, you don't have to convince me. That's why I barely could read that uh, sentence in the psalm. When he said that, uh, you know, out of the heart, we speak as Isaiah unclean lips. I kind of knew that too. Jesus said that in Matthew and also in Luke, that out of the overflow of our heart, the mouth speaks. How many times have I gotten in trouble for letting things in my heart just spill out of my mouth. But what's going to stick with me today is when Scott said that confession is making space for God and making space for the kingdom. That took my breath away. And I want to reflect on that. So I want you to come with me for a moment. We're going to, we don't always do this, but we're going to pray a corporate prayer together. It means we're all going to pray it together. It's a prayer of confession. It comes from uh, my college at Colgate University. Uh, Scott told Donald Miller's college story. Uh, some of you have heard me talk about Dr. Coleman Brown, the chaplain at Colgate University. Now, I was raised in church, but I was just religious. But Coleman Brown brought me to Jesus Christ, and with him I became a Christian, a follower of Christ. I have a book of his sermons. It's a treasure piece for me that I keep close to me. And at the very end of this book is a prayer of confession that we prayed at University Church every single Sunday. Coleman loved it so much, he made sure it had this big final page in his book of sermons. And I want to pray it together with you. I, as I prayed it, uh, preparing for today, as Scott and Terry and I were sharing, I'm reminded how, how much this prayer had so much to do with me making space and the saving grace of Jesus Christ coming into our life. And if you hear these words, making space for the Revelation 7-9 church, the kingdom of God, as Scott said, that is all around us. So would you pray with me these words? They'll be on the screen. Servant Lord and God of glory, we are before you this morning as broken men and women in need of forgiveness. Having come from anguish moments in the night or betrayals in the day, having said cutting words, or no words, often bewildered by the obvious or subtle suffering that we see or that is our own, we have been uncertain. We have concentrated on defense of ourselves and have found the condemnation of others easy. We have not received others simply as they are, nor met them as ourselves. Here are various inward cries Forgive us and heal us. Alone we cannot be healed. Therefore, lead us to the discovery of others. Free us from our several bondages. Cleanse our hearts with honesty. Give us courage to accompany our fears and bring us even to faith and hope and love. In the strong name of Jesus, amen. And now go as people living out confession making room for reconciliation, and let's widen the circle of Christ's love. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.